From CFO Stacy Marcotte, really wanted to be here for this kickoff, but she got called away into a meeting. But she'll be here shortly, and we'll welcome you, and we'll reappear throughout the program. So you'll get plenty of time, Stacy. Um, our first order of business today is to give you a round of applause for recently joining our DHS CFO team and seeking to learn more about our operations. So how about it? Give yourself a hand. So about today, um, this is not your usual orientation. Our goal today is to provide you with a good dose of enterprise perspective. What's enterprise perspective? It's understanding the bigger organization and how we work together. We have a six hour program that focuses on the roles of and collaboration between headquarters and component CFOs and other management lines of business. In general, we won't be speaking specifically about your office, but about how we collectively and in partnership su support the department in its many missions, which we'll talk about in a minute. Today's program is an initiative within the Human Capital Strategy. Has anybody heard of the Human Capital Strategy yet? I see one hand. Okay. Well, you're going to learn more about it today. Um, it was established, published in 2017, and it identifies 15 specific activities or initiatives that will put our people first and will help make DHS CFOs a workplace of choice, which is the intended outcome. Creating more enterprise awareness is one of these six key goals. We think that increasing your enterprise awareness will help you understand where you fit in the big picture and how important everybody's office's roles are. You'll hear that we all have to row together and in the same direction to get things done well. Making these points will be an outstanding group of speakers that will share their perspectives on our enterprise, including several CFOs, CXOs, and our own Deputy Undersecretary of Management. Now since many of you are relatively new employees, let me ask you something. Do you know what a CXO is? I see some heads nodding. So just in case you don't, let me clarify. Within the management uh, directorate, there are several administrative functions that are led by chief executives. So, for instance, you have the CFO, but you have the CIO in, front, in charge of IT, the CSO, in charge of security, S being security, etc., etc., CPO, procurement. So, in, to put these into a group, we call them CXOs. And there are seven of them that all work together to get our mission done. And together, they and other offices make up the management director. So just for context. Um, I will, uh, let me just say, I think the fact that these very important people took time out of their busy schedules shows our commitment um, to you and putting our people first and our commitment to your development and institutional understanding. So please do us a favor. This is a rare opportunity to get, in, to get a lot of senior executives in front of you and they're of many of them, there can be a dozen senior executives, please ask questions. Please ask these folks questions. Um, so, to open our program, you'll hear about the various and vital missions DHS is tasked with and how they are organized. Then, we'll, then we will share with you our strategic planning processes and approaches, including the human capital strategy, which I just mentioned, that brought about this event. And I bet that you'll find there's something in the human capital strategy for you. Then we will discuss our new planning, programming, budgeting, and execution process. Has anybody heard of PPB and E? I would hope so. If you're in the finance community, you should certainly know about that. Um, it's just getting integrated into the department, so that's why we want to introduce it to you. You'll find a useful handout that's attached to your agenda, agenda that demonstrates our PPBE cycle. So that is um, something that you should definitely focus on, and we have a great panel for that. After lunch, you'll hear about synergies. You'll hear about the synergies between component, how component CFOs work together, and you'll hear about the synergies of how the management directorate CXOs work together. Tying it all up to close the program will be Chip Fulgham, who will share from, the top, share from what he sees from the top of the management directorate on all of our respective roles and organizational priorities. By the end of the day, we hope that you have gained a greater appreciation for the work we do as individuals in our offices and as part of CFO offices and as part of the overall management team. 
And please don't forget to let us know how we did today by filling out the evaluation form on your agenda. We really appreciate that feedback so we can continue to make this program better. So let's get started. Um, I'd like to introduce our first speakers who provide an overview of the DHS missions to kick things off. Grace Lee is an assistant director who leads the resource team for the Program Analysis and Evaluation Division here at headquarters. It's also known as PANE. Grace leads analytical studies and supports the decision-making process for senior leadership on resource issues across the department. Grace has been with DHS for six and a half years. Joining Grace is John Decker, who's also an assistant director. He leads the budget formulation and execution team for the budget division here at headquarters. John leads the department's annual budget submission to OMB and Congress, heavy lift, and oversees the execution of the department's budget, not uh, also a heavy lift. John has been with DHS for two and a half years. So let's give a warm welcome to Grace and John. Safeguard and secure the cyberspace, that's essentially NPD's mission space. 
Five is to strengthen national preparedness and resilience. That's FEMA's mission space. And the trying to strengthen homeland security. That's looking at FLETSI for training, SNT for R&D, the management directorate, the secretary's office, OIG, etc. I and and ops as well. And then we'll go through the HS machinery one. Okay, Transportation Security Administration. Is there anyone here from TSA? Okay. Um, obviously, they're, they're very visible. I'm sure everybody is familiar with TSA and, and what they do and what their role is. You see them anytime you travel. Um, you pay a fee anytime you travel, a portion of which TSA uses to help offset their total budget. So their mission, protect the nation's transportation system to ensure freedom of movement for people and commerce, clearly uh, established after the events of 9-11 to ensure that passenger screening was completed, standardized across uh, the country, as well as the screening of check baggage and carry-on baggage. So a lot of their acquisition type programs are geared towards how they can better do screening both for carry-on and check baggage to ensure that passengers are only carrying through what they should be and that we are all safe as we fly and travel about. Their budget is $7.7 .7 billion and 55, 56,000 people. Uh, one of our larger components as it relates to personnel. So as you can imagine, a fairly significant part of their budget goes to pay. From a department-wide perspective, it's about 54, 55% of our budget is, is all pay related. So that covers both military and civilian pay. Um, for TSA, it's, it's roughly about the same. It's about 46% of their budget actually goes to pay their people uh, to ensure that they're at the airports and other ports of entry, screening baggage, and keeping us safe. And also, a very another important aspect of their mission is the canine program that they have for explosive detection. They were set up as a counterfeit agency, and it wasn't until 1902 that they took on the mission of protecting the president as well as the president's families. Um, so those are still the two main mission spaces of Secret Service. So they do financial crimes, especially in counterfeit, and that can be in cyber as well as non-cyber. Um, and then there's also the investigations piece, and that's investigating threats against the president and the vice president and their families and the protection and protection and travel of the president, the vice president, their families, as well as um, senior officials that visit the country as well. So their budget is $2.4 $2 billion. There are 7,600 personnel. Secret Service has, in the recent years, had really struggled with people. Um, there was an increase in demand in their mission space. Um, they did not have a lot of people to support that. They struggled with morale issues. They struggled with attrition issues. And in recent efforts, Secret Service has really made it a concerted effort in um, hiring. And they've been on track and actually exceeding their hiring goals. So that's something to really commend um, the service for. And I think overall, a lot of the components have really been looking at the execution of their people and how to properly resource them in formulation so that we are able to reallocate our resources and not have Congress or OMB take our money that they see us under executing to then repurpose it somewhere else. So their major activities are in protective detail, security of the White House complex, um, and what else do they do? That's, so security of the White House complex, that's the operational mission support, OMS, a program that they do, so it's looking at the White House facilities and the surrounding areas and how can we better enhance technology so that there aren't any threats that we can be more preemptive or proactive to their threat phases. Um, one of their major acquisition programs that they're looking at is in their fully armored vehicle, so that's the vehicle that the president travels to and from, whether it's locally or internationally, so it's, it's generally around the security of the president um, you can imagine that you know, when it comes to their resources, every four years, at campaign years, you see a spike in the CVP and the Secret Services budget just because of the increase in overtime and the increase in resources for national security events that occur 
during and leading up to elections. So they are what we call more of a plan profile um, than just a steady growth at inflation. So it's looking at you know FY16, you'll see them spike up. FY20, they go back up. FY24, they go back up, and then they scale down as they kind of transition down. Um, is anybody from Secret Service here? Great. So you guys got to all learn about them. Okay, Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction Office. Their mission is pretty much in the title of, of their name. Uh, their role is to deter um, weapons of mass destruction. Relatively um, a smaller organization, but a very important mission uh, for what we do and, and what they contribute. So less than probably 1% of our, of our total budget, 429 million and 248 personnel. Again, a major role is detecting bioterrorism, uh, domestic nuclear detection, and Office of Health Affairs. Anyone from CWMD here? Okay. CWMD was, prior to that, they were known as two separate agencies, which was Office of Health Affairs and then the Domestic Nuclear Detection Office, DNDO, so those two have combined and become CWMD. They primarily do the radiolog radiological and nuclear R&D and acquisition programs uh, for the department. They work with various labs, uh, labs that they own as well as uh, labs with other, with other agencies, and I'm kind of jumping ahead. But, uh, and also various grant programs where they're out in the communities looking at how to secure, the program is called Securing the Cities. Uh, how to actually go about working with the local governments to better secure the cities and prepare them. They're there for a small amount of time or several years and then they transition out and turn that program over to the local government of that city to run. So the missionaries are to secure and manage our borders. Um, CUP is a very big player in this space as you guys can imagine. Anybody from CUP in the room? Um, so, they manage, control, and protect the nation's border at and between ports of entry and also facilitate legitimate commerce and travel of people and goods. Their budget is $16.7 billion. I actually think that they have the highest budget out of all the components in the department at this point. Um, and they're comprised of 65, about 65,000 personnel. People make up about six to 70 percent of CUP's budget. It's a very people-heavy uh, component. They have three major units, the Border Patrol. So these are the folks who are, who are patrolling between ports of entry. You have the Office of Field Operations. These are the individuals who are at the ports of entry. And then the Office of Air and Marine. So um, CUP also does Marine. They own boats. They, they go out and they do marine security as well, as well as air, air operations. And that's in support of not just CBP, but also other components as well. Um, as you can imagine, the major activities is in the border security enhancements, including the border wall. I believe in the 19th budget, we requested $1.6 billion in the wall. In the 20th submission to OMB, we requested $1.8 billion. Uh, we were required to submit a border security improvement plan to Congress, and that's the profile we laid out in that plan, and that's the plan that the administration wants us to submit in. Um, it's an area that there's a lot of scrutiny and a lot of administrative administration's interest in this area. Uh, but we're also looking at border wall, not just what's the physical barriers, but also looking at the border technology. So what are the systems that we need to put in place as well as just a physical barrier, and what are some areas that we can um, fix as well as laying in new walls. So that's, and there's so many other complications that just come with putting up physical infrastructure. Trade and travel security, um, a lot of this is the National Targeting Center operations as well. So they run the screening and vetting of cargo and people that come in and out of our country. The National Vetting Center um, is another area of administration interest. Vetting is a high priority for this administration, and so that operation also falls under NTC as well as under CBP. Um, and they are an area where um, I think folks see CBP as a major growth area when it comes to their resources, and 
It is, they are, but they are also an organization where they're told exactly where to spend their resources, which is also a struggle because there might be areas where you have to maybe sustain current operations or you want to try to pay your current people or you're trying to fix or recapitalize current assets, but you're getting money but being directed where you must spend them. And so, yes, they are a growth industry, but they're also part of this very political whirlwind where they have some limitations in, a, in their ability to be able to program. So, I mean, that, I think that is one of the struggles that CBD faces. U.S. Coast Guard. I think we have some Coast Guard people here. Yes, all right, excellent. Uh, so the Coast Guard really falls into a, a multi-mission category, but for purposes of briefing, we, we put them in this category in Mission Area 2. Um, Coast Guard serves both sort of a dual role of within the homeland in a domestic capacity as well as an international military capacity. They're one of the, uh, the nation's five military services. So they're, I'll say they're dual-hatted, but really it's more than dual-hatted. They do a little bit of a little bit of everything. Their budget also very large, $11.6 million, and from a, a component perspective, 50,000 personnel. So that's split between military personnel and civilian personnel. I believe it's about 41,000 military, and the rest are civilian. They also have a reserve force of about 39,000 uh, that they can activate if need be. Um, they are sort of an acquisition, probably next to CBP and wall funding. Uh, they're one of our acquisition heavy components with about roughly $2 billion in acquisition programs, most of it going towards um, cover programs. So major activities, again, as I said, they kind of do it all, maritime law enforcement, Safety search and rescue, security operations, maritime stewardship and environmental protection, and then national defense operations. So, DHS Mission Area 3 and Force of Ministry are immigration laws. ICE is a major player in this space. Anybody from ICE here? Um, so, ICE enforces the U.S. Immigration and Customs laws, um, and we do this in a variety of ways. Um, their budget is $8.9 million, they have 26,000 personnel, their major unit is Homeland Security Investigation, as well as and the Enforcement and Removal Operations. So HSI is the investigative arm of DHS. Um, I think in some cases, when we look at HSI mission space, we may think it seems very similar to the FBI mission space. And I, when I first heard of it, that's what I thought so too. But the, the unique thing about the HSI's mission is that they're able to operate and investigate internationally for um, crimes within the United States. So what, they, what their unique ability to do is they can follow money or money trails from international countries. And, and that's where FBI's limitations lie, is that they are more within the U.S. territory, whereas FBI has authorities to operate outside. So there's this little bit of a nuance there that I think um, makes FBI really, I mean, HSI really valuable when it comes to a lot of joint task forces, is that they can they have this ability to look at that. They also look at cyber crimes. They're tracing, um, they're looking at transnational criminal organizations. They provide a lot of intel that supports um, not just ICE operations, but CEP operations, Coast Guard operations, et cetera. Um, enforcement removal operations is probably the area that we hear the most about. This is where the beds fall. This is where um, the removal officers fall. And this is also an element of that is um, the OPLA, so the attorneys. But these are the folks who take so when there are illegal immigrants and they, they're not claiming asylum or they came or they claimed asylum through the system and they're detained and they go in and they're sitting at an ICE bed facility. At some point they're processed and then they go before a DOJ immigration attorney, IJ immigration judge, um, and then you will have a OPLA attorney or um, the ICE's attorney there to represent the U.S. government and they go back and forth on this on the judicial process on whether this individual should be removed. 
the individual has an opportunity to appeal, et cetera. You can imagine that there are a lot of appeals. There is also a lot of backlog. Um, and, and I think this is an area definitely when you're looking at the entire immigration structure, it's hard to just look at it from a single landscape. So there's ISIS equities as well as DOJ equities. So it's definitely a multi-agency effort as well. Um, and they're also, they're very, they do a lot of operations into the trafficking of human arms and drugs. A lot of these do um, fund terrorist organizations, as well as just overall threats to the U.S. Um, economy, infrastructure, border security, etc. U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Service, they oversee our nations and administer the nation's immigration laws. Their budget is 4.7 billion and roughly 20,000 uh, personnel. The, their major responsibilities, so they manage the e-verify or the employment verification process. Anytime someone applies for a job, they're checked through the e-verify program. They conduct fraud investigations, uh, interview and screen refugee and asylum applicants around the world. So when someone shows up at the border and claims asylum, CIS is responsible for holding that interview and meeting with those individuals. They also manage the naturalization process um, for immigrants that are coming into the country and also, the, as you can see, the ceremonies um, for our, our newest citizens. She forms safeguard secure cyberspace. We have one component in this space. It's NPP CISA, uh, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Infrastructure Security Agency. Anybody from CISA here? Um, so CISA was recently signed into law, um, and in doing so, a few changes happened. So one was Open got kicked out, and they got moved up to management, somewhere in management. The decision hasn't been made yet, but that transition will happen. Um, their primary mission space is cybersecurity, and not just the internal cybersecurity of DHS, but also the security of the .gov domain. That's where you'll hear about the CDM program, Continuous Diagnostics Mitigation. Um, it's a multi-phase program, and it's looking and assessing cybersecurity or systems that other agencies are hosting, and looking at what's the security efforts of these type of programs, um, as well as infrastructure protection. Um, this is looking at the critical infrastructure, and there are intersections between critical infrastructure as well as cybersecurity, as you guys can imagine, and federal protective service. So this is FPS. So while there are 19 budgets, the mission is 3.5 billion. About half of that is for FPS. FPS is the folks, um, the people, and the contracts that secure federal buildings. So when you're coming in here, those individuals up front are off of FPS contracts. Um, they do a lot of coordination with interstate. They work closely with industry as well, looking at what are the emerging cybersecurity spaces. Um, and they, and CISA is really an agency that um, is leading in looking at what are the cybersecurity threats to the U.S. government in that space. And that's, and I think, part of becoming an operational component is also elevating. CISA to be, to be more proactive and lead forward leading in that mission. Federal Emergency Management Agency. I think everybody is probably also familiar with FEMA. Um, they've been a major part of what's been in the news and what's been happening not only recently with wildfires, but also with the hurricane season we had, especially last year with so many of them. Their mission builds, sustain, and improve the nation's capability to prepare for, protect against, respond to, recover from, and mitigate all hazards. Additional, so part of that is their responsibility is they, they work with communities and survivors before and after um, disasters. They work with communities trying to prevent disasters from happening or looking at floodplain areas and where they can work projects to mitigate risk. Their budget is $16 billion and 11,000 personnel, so that number is a little, 11,000 is a little, it varies. Uh, that is not their steady state number, but that is the number of, of positions that they have in, if there's a disaster that needs to come up or that does arise, they're able to call in additional resources, maybe experts in certain areas where they need 
their assistance. They also have within the department the search capacity force, so you're able to volunteer for that if, to go and assist FEMA during natural disasters. Of the $16 billion, roughly 6.7 is for the disaster relief fund. So again, that falls into that mandatory account of, of funding. Money that we set aside specifically for uh, disaster relief and should the need arise as it did last year, we do additional supplemental budget requests to Congress to receive more additional funding if, if there isn't enough available in a disaster relief fund to cover all that is happening. Um, so these are going to be comprised largely of our support components. So federal law enforcement training centers. Um, so let's say is the training arm of DHS as well as for other federal law enforcement agencies. So what they do for other agencies is what we call basic training, basic law enforcement training. So when you hire a ICE agent or when you hire a border patrol agent, um, then they for basic training, they go to FLETC. Everybody goes to FLETC Center to get their basic training, so everyone's getting the same type of basic training, and then they may get more specialized training at their component headquarters. So once an ICE agent leaves FLETC, then they go back to a, they go back to um, ICE, and then ICE has some specific specialized training for their agents that they'll conduct. Um, so FLETC pays for about 60% of requested um, training from all federal law enforcement agencies as well as from within DHS and anything in addition to that the components do as a reimbursable back to FLETC. So as you can imagine with the CBP hiring and with the ICE hiring and the Secret Service hiring a lot of that also has a cascading impact to the FLETC's resource and their top line. Um, a lot of their resources is in just the training center so housing for their folks um, instructors for their folks and just overall facilities so that they can be more efficient with their resources. <coughs> um, they have a few facilities. One that's most well known is the Glencoe facilities down in Georgia uh, and it also requires just a lot of coordination with components to just anticipate needs. So when components are under executing in their hiring, that impacts Fletzi because if Fletzi had planned for them to bring those folks on, that they budgeted for that. So as you guys are just looking and doing your coordination, like be, be mindful of the fact that even as components, what may impact your resource also has a cascading impact to other partner uh, components within DHS. Science and Technology Director at anyone from s &T? All right. So there our research and development arm, really, of the department working across with the various agencies, enable effective, efficient, and secure operations across all Homeland Security missions by applying scientific, engineering, analytical, and innovative approaches to deliver timely solutions and support departmental acquisitions. So they're partnering with the components doing the research and development on various technologies and improvements that need to be made. Their budget, 583 million and 431 people. So analysis and operations. We always talk about these uh, books together. I am from INA, our ops here. So 